This is Richard Hammock's Calculus One course. We are in part five of the course on integration. Today in lecture 41, we'll talk about area and also what are called Riemann sums. This is actually our third lecture of part five of the course. And when we began part five, I said that I would hold off on giving an overview of part five until after the first two lectures. So here we are in lecture 41, it's a good time to talk about an overview of part five, a roadmap of where we've been in part five so far and also where we're going. Part five of the course is going to connect two seemingly unrelated themes that have a surprisingly close connection. We've seen part of this in the first two lectures of part five. In lectures 39 and 40, we talked about antiderivatives, the process of carrying differentiation backwards. In the next two lectures, this one and the next one, we'll talk about something that seems like a complete new topic. We'll be concerned with area under the graph of a function y equals f of x and between two x values, a and b, as indicated here. The question will be, how many square units of area is there? On the surface, it looks like that has nothing to do with antiderivatives. However, it has everything to do with antiderivatives. And we'll see that in lecture 43 on the fundamental theorem of calculus which you can view as the culmination of the entire course. It's a very surprising result. We'll see that these two things are very, very closely connected. And actually, the fundamental theorem of calculus goes way beyond area. It's very far-reaching. And the rest of part five will just be examining the consequences of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is a roadmap for the rest of the course. We've talked about antiderivatives in the previous two lectures. Today, we'll start talking about area. And coming up ahead is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's talk about today's topic, area under curves. As I mentioned on the previous slide, we're going to be very concerned with the problem of finding the area under the graph of a function y equals f of x between two x values a and b, as indicated here. You've got a function y equals f of x above the x-axis, and you look at the area shaded in this picture. And the question is, how many square units of area is contained? in that region. That's actually a fairly difficult question because we have lots of formulas for area, but they're all for familiar geometric figures, triangles, rectangles, circles, and so on. If you had a complicated function like, um, I don't know, sine of x or something like that, what's the area under the curve? We have no formulas for it yet, but starting today, we're going to develop formulas in a very interesting way. I'll show you the approach that we're going to take. Given this curve and this region, since we don't have any formulas for its area, we're going to get at the area by using familiar shapes where we do have formulas for their, air, their area. And in fact, we're going to approximate the area A here with rectangles whose area we can find. We're going to set up a system of rectangles going from A to B, whose heights go up to the curve. So this would be our first rectangle, then our second, our third, and so on. And here in this picture, at least, we, we, we have seven rectangles. 
but in general you might have n rectangles. And the idea here is that although we can't, uh, can't get the area of this region A with a formula, we can at least approximate it as the sum of the areas of these n rectangles. And the area of a rectangle is easy to compute. It's base times height. So we can say that our A here is approximately equal to the sum of the areas of n rectangles. It's just an approximation because you can see that these rectangles overshoot the graph. So the sum of their areas is actually going to be a little bit bigger than A. But it'll be pretty close. But pretty close is not good enough. We want an equality. So what could we do with this scheme to make this a better approximation? Well, increase the number of rectangles. Here we have seven rectangles. Double that to 14 rectangles. Or in general, n rectangles, where n is a pretty big number. The picture would look like this. And if you add up the sum of the areas of those n rectangles, you can see that that's a better approximation to the area A. The overshoots, there are more of them, but they're much smaller, as you can see. Still, it's just an approximation. So you would, to get a better approximation, increase the number of rectangles. Maybe we have like 50 rectangles. I'm not going to count them here. But you can see that if you added up the areas of these n rectangles and added them all together, you would get a very good approximation to the area A. Maybe it's just a little bit bigger than A because you, you can see these visible overshoots, but there's not much extra area that's added there. So that would be a very close approximation to A, but not quite. So what do you do? Increase the number of rectangles. And here, I don't know, maybe we have like a hundred rectangles or a thousand rectangles. And if you added up their areas, you would get a very good approximation to the area A that we're looking for. You can't even see the overshoots here. For all intents and purposes, these, say, 100 or 1,000 rectangles fit the contour of the curve almost perfectly. So the sum of the areas of those n rectangles is very close to the area A. You'd have to take a magnifying glass to see that actually it's not quite equal to A, probably going to be a little bigger than A, at least in this picture, because you can see these overshoots. So what are we going to do? Well, we have a situation where the more rectangles you're adding in here, the closer and closer the sum of their areas is to this ideal area A that we're looking for. So you would say that the area A here is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of the areas of n rectangles. And this is exactly the approach we're going to take today to answer the question of what is the area under this curve. We're going to express that as a limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of the areas of n rectangles as suggested by this picture. And this is going to be a very productive point of view. But there's one little detail that we need to take care of before we do that. We're going to use this limit, but I want you to hold this thought for just a moment. The little detail that we have to take care of is this. In this limit, we have the sum of the areas of n rectangles, and n is going to infinity. If n is a really big number, a hundred, a thousand, a million, the expression for the sum of the areas of that many rectangles is going to be really complicated. So what we're going to do for the moment is we're going to take a little detour, go off on a tangent, and talk about a notation that's very useful for computing or expressing 
very large sums. It's called sigma notation. So we'll go off on that tangent. It'll take about 20 minutes, and then we'll come back to this thought that we're holding for now. So to carry out this plan, we need a notation for sums with many terms. Going off on this tangent, we're going to talk about what is called sigma notation. And this is our notation for really big sums. And it works like this. Suppose you've got a function f and n is a positive integer, then you maybe you know n could be like a thousand or a hundred or or you know, think of it as a pretty big number. Then look at the sum f of 1 plus f of 2 plus f of 3 plus f of 4, and so on continued, and you know, then after that f of 5 plus f of 6, all the way up continued until you get to f of n, um, and you add all of those up. You might even think about these as being sums of areas of rectangles, like on the previous slide. Well, if n is a thousand, then this sum has a thousand terms, and you wouldn't want to write that down. So here's what we do. We're going to, I'm going to put a little piece of notation right here that's going to stand for this big sum. And the notation is this. It has a Greek letter sigma, which you are going to read as sum. And you would read this piece of notation as the sum from k equals 1 to n of f of k. And what this sum means is that you're doing exactly what appears on the left. The idea is you start with k, which is a variable, equal to 1, and you take f of k. And then you let k be equal to 2, and you add on f of 2. And then you let k be equal to 3, and you add on f of 3. So you get f of 1 plus f of 2 plus f of 3. And you're going to carry out this process all the way up to the term n. And that's going to be the last term of your sum. So for example, consider the sum from k equals 1 to 5 of k squared plus 1. So here k squared plus 1 is our f of k. It's a function. It's a function of k. And the way the sigma notation would work is that you can tell this is going to be a sum with five terms from k equals 1 up to 5. And in the first term, you plug in 1 for k. So you get 1 squared plus 1. That's 1 plugged in for k. And then you're going to let k be equal to 2, the number after 1. And you have a term 2 squared plus 1. So you're plugging 2 into to the k squared plus 1. Um, and then you plug 3 into the k squared plus 1. And then you plug 4 into the k squared plus 1. Um, and you keep doing this all the way up until k equals 5, which would be this last term. And you stop right there because the 5 up, of the, up at the top, that indicates that's as far out as you go. So the sum from k equals 1 to 5 of k squared plus 1 is just the sum of these numbers. Um, so 1 squared plus 1 is 2, plus 4 plus 1 is 5, plus 10, and so on. If you add those up, you get 60. So the sum from k equals 1 to 5 of k squared plus 1 equals 60. Here's another one. The sum from k equals 1 to 10 of k, just plain old k. Well, k is a function too. This is the identity function, where f of k equals k. So what would this be? Well, the first term would be you plug in k equals 1 to k. That's a 1 plus a, then you plug in 2, plus a 2, then plug in 3, that's plus a 3, all the way up to plus a 10. So this sum would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus etc., all the way up to 10. You just successively plug in values of 1 through 10 into k, and you add them up. And if you do that, you can see that you get 55.
How about this one? The sum from k equals 1 to 1,000 of sine of pi k. Now, that's a lot of terms, that 1,000. So this looks complicated, but actually, you've probably already noticed that this is really simple because whatever k is, whatever integer k is, pi times k is an integer multiple of pi, and sine of that is 0. So this sum would be sine of pi plus sine of 2 pi plus sine of 3 pi plus sine of 4 pi all the way up to plus sine of 1,000 pi, and every one of those k pi's is sine of that is zero. So you're just adding zero to itself a thousand times and you get zero. Another example. This looks kind of weird, but you see stuff like this from time to time. Sum from k equals one to 10 of two. So this two, according to our pattern up here, should be a function of k. And 2 is just a constant function where, you know, you, whatever k you plug in, you just get 2. Sometimes it may bother you that you don't see a place to plug in a k here the way you did in these other problems. If that bothers you, replace that 2 with 2 plus 0 times k, right? So now you have a place to plug in the k. So for k equals 1, it's 2 plus 0 times 1. Then you plug in 2, 2 plus 0 times 2 plus 2 times 0 times 3, and so on. And in every case, you just get a 2 because the 0 times k, whatever k is, is 0. And so you're just adding 2 to itself 10 times, and so you get 20. I'm going to um, go up and put another problem right here before we move on to the next slide. I've replaced what was here with something that looks very similar to what's above. Um, the only difference is that it's the sum from k equals 3 to 5 of k squared plus 1. We don't do this often, but I do want to point out that k doesn't have to start at 1. It could start at any other number. In this case, k equals 3. And so the way this works is the very first term would be plugging in 3 to the function and then you plug in 4 to the function, and you go all the way up to this number 5, and you plug in 5 for that function. And so you're just adding the terms in for k between 3 and 5. You don't add in the term for the 1 and the 2. Um, and that's equal to 53. So you may see that from time to time. Maybe not so much in our lecture today, but as you're working the problems in the textbook. Okay, so we've got our notation, and um, there are some great formulas that go along with this notation. First of all, and this is like the sum from k equals 1 to n of 2 that we just saw. If you have an expression like that, the sum from k equals 1 to n of c, where c is just a constant, just like the example we saw before, that's just adding c to itself n times. So the answer is going to be nc. Sum from k equals 1 to n of c equals n times c. So um, a really simple self-explanatory equation there. Very simple, but we're going to think of that as a formula. This equals this value, n times c. Now here's another one that's really interesting. It turns out that if you take the sum from k equals 1 to n of k, um, like we had on the previous page, which is just 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on, all the way up to plus n. That turns out to be equal to n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Even when n is really big, like a billion, the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to plus a billion would be a billion times a billion plus 1 divided by 2. So this little formula here is calculating the sum of n terms in this expression. Now let me give you a quick indication of why this formula works. And I'll, it's, um, I'll draw a little picture off to the side here. This has a really simple visual explanation. Look at the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus etc. all the way up to plus n. Think about that as 
the number of blue rectangles in this stair-shaped sort of triangle that's n blocks wide by n blocks high. The first block would be one square unit of area plus, and then the second column is two square units of area, then plus three square units of area, plus four square units of area, and so on all the way up to plus n square units of area. So you might look at the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to n as being the area of this blue region. And that blue region, if you take a piece that looks exactly like it, and I'll make it white and turn it upside down, it fits like a glove into or onto the blue stair steps. So this white stair step is just like the blue stair step turned around and put on top of the blue one. And that forms a rectangle of base n and height n plus 1. And the blue region is exactly half of this rectangle, half the area of this rectangle. And that blue region is the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to n. And it's half of this n by n plus 1 rectangle, so the number of square units of area that are blue would have to be the area of that rectangle, n times n plus 1, divided by 2 half of that rectangle. And that's why this formula works. So for example, we'll do it way down the bottom here. We saw this example on the previous page, the sum from k equals 1 to 10 of k. So it fits this pattern with n equals 10. That's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, etc., all the way up to plus 10. And on the previous page, we calculated that it was 55, right, if you add all of these up. Well, let's just check it by using this formula. The formula says that this sum should be equal to, let's see, our n is 10, so we plug in an n here. So it'd be 10 times 10 plus 1 over 2. Um, and that's, let's see, 10 over 2 is 5. 5 times 11 is 55. And that's exactly the answer we got on the previous page, just adding up these in our heads. OK, continuing with our formulas, here's an interesting formula. And you'll read about this in the textbook. The sum from k equals 1 to n of k squared, which is 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus etc., all the way up to plus n squared. It turns out to be equal to n times n plus 1 times 2 times n plus 1 over 6. Now don't panic because I'm not going to demand that you know this formula. Um, it's, it's going to be useful to us in the lecture and also maybe as you work a few homework problems, but you don't have to remember this for a test. It's not going to be an integral part of what we do, so don't worry about that. Now, if, I'm not going to, I don't have room to show it here why this works. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to prove that this sum equals this expression. Uh, but if you go online, there are some really beautiful picture proofs of, uh, that are like kind of three-dimensional versions of what's happening here that show that this sum equals this expression. So if you're interested, take a look. If not, just accept this on faith. One thing I'm going to do here, I just want to change it ever so slightly. I want to, this is the way the text writes it, but on the next slide, we're going to um, want it to be slightly simplified. If you FOIL out these two terms and then multiply the n through, that turns out to be 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n over 6. So uh, sum from k equals 1 to n of k squared equals this expression, which of course depends on n, because you know, if n is big, this could be a pretty big expression. So you expect it to increase its value to increase with n. Now you may want to, if you, you're following along the lecture, maybe maybe you want to jot this, this one down because we're going to be using that in the next several slides. Just for the record, here's one more formula. The sum from k equals 1 to n of k cubed is 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed plus etc. all the way up to n cubed. It turns out that a simple compact formula for that is n squared times n plus 1 over 4.
It's really the square of what we had up there. And um, again, there's some really nice picture proofs of why this is true that you may want to look up. But we're just noting this for the record. And again, the formulas on this page, you, you, um, you really uh, shouldn't expect them to pay, play a big role in this course. Although you will use them, we'll use them in the lecture today, and you'll use them for a few homework problems. And in using them, you're going to train your mind to think about things in a really productive way. And that's really their value as I see it for us in this class. Um, but in and of themselves, they're not going to be on the test. Okay, so we have four formulas here. Um, and there are also some rules for sigma notation. If you had the sum from k equals l to n of f of k plus g of k, if you ever had something like that where you're adding these two functions together, well, you know, the what's going to happen here is you're adding f of l plus f of l plus 1 and so on all the way up to n to themselves. And the same thing for g. You could just group all the f of k's together and all the g of k's together, and you get these two separate sums. Sum from k equals l to n of f of k plus the sum from, e, sum from k equals l to n of g of k. So this rule says that you can always break a sum of the sum of two functions up into two separate sigmas like this. And also, it should be pretty clear that that plus could be replaced with a negative, and it falls through right there. Um, and one other rule that we're going to use with some degree of frequency is the following. It's sort of like a constant multiple rule. It says that if you ever have the sum from k equals l to n of c times f of k, and usually that's going to be sum from k equals 1 to n of c times f of k. If you think about that, that's adding c times f of l plus c times f of l plus 1 plus c times f of l plus 2, all the way up to c times f of n for the last term. Every term has a c in it. You could factor that c out, and you get that c times the sum of all of those terms. So this is saying that we can factor a c out of a sigma in the manner described here. Really, that's just the distributive law for addition. OK, let's do one quick example, and we can soon get back to area. Um, but the, here, we're just flexing our muscles and exercising our um, mental muscles with this new idea of very big sums. Think about the sum from k equals 1 to 100 of 5 plus 2k squared over 3. So if you wanted to do this with a calculator, you'd be adding up 100 terms that are fairly complicated. It would take a while. But we're going to see that by using these properties and the formulas from the previous page, then we're going to get an answer for this sum very quickly. So let's see, what could we do? The first thing we could note is that this 5 plus 2k squared divided by 3, that breaks up into two separate fractions. That's the 5 plus 2k squared over 3 is a 5 over 3 plus 2k squared over 3. And why would we want to write it that way? Because maybe we want to use this property. Property 1, or rule 1, says that the sum from k equals 1 to 100 of 5 over 3 plus 2k squared over 3 equals this. Sum from k equals 1 to 100 of 5 thirds, which is that first function, plus sum from k equals 1 to 100, 2k squared over 3, which is our second expression here. So now we've broken our problem up into two simpler sigmas that get added together. And look at this first one, the sum from k equals 1 to 100 of 5 thirds, and 5 thirds is a constant. Well, that's just adding 5 thirds to itself 100 times. So that's going to be 100 times 5 thirds. From that's, in fact, that's a, one of the formulas we had on the previous page, the really simple one. And also, the second expression here, um, it's got a 2 over 3 in it. That's a constant. That could come out. The constant of 2 thirds could come out front 
right there, and all we're left with is a k squared. So at this point, we're getting um, some concrete numbers here. We've got the sum from k equals 1 to 100 of k squared. But remember, we had a formula for that. I, so I'm going to ask you to write down um, on the previous slide. So if we plugged in what that formula says this is equal to, um, we get, let's see, the 100 times 5 over 3 is 500 over 3 plus the 2 thirds right here. And here's what the formula says that the sum from k equals 1 to 100 of k squared is going to be 100 times 100 plus 1 times 2 times 100 plus 1 divided by 6. And now if you just crunch those numbers, you get 677,200 divided by 3. So that number is what the sum equals. So we got that pretty quickly. Okay, um, so we've looked at sigma notation, and remember that thought I told you to hold, to find the area under the curve, and I said we'd need sigma notation to make further progress with that? Well, now we can go back and uh, return to that thought and make that progress. So the problem was to find the area A under the graph of a function between two numbers A and B, and just for definiteness here, um, I'm using the function f of x equals x squared, and um, the numbers, the x values are a equals 0 and b equals 2, and we're looking for the area under the graph in between a and b, which is 0 and 2. So the question is, what is the shaded area a? How many square units of area do we have? Now here's the process that we're going to use. We indicated earlier that we were going to use rectangles to approximate the area and then start squeezing in more and more and more and more rectangles. And we're going to carry out that plan on this slide. But we're going to have to be very systematic and precise about how we do this. Let's say we want n rectangles. The first thing we have to do is divide the interval from 0 to 2 up into n equally sized pieces. And I put these tick marks in here. And they divide, if n is the number of rectangles you want, they're dividing this interval from 0 to 2 into n pieces. So let's see, if you take any one of them, they all, all these pieces, they have equal length. You're taking the distance from 0 to 2, you're dividing it into n pieces. So the width of each of these pieces would be um, 2 divided by n. And we're going to call that delta x. So delta x indicates the width of each of these one of each of these intervals. This one is width delta x. This one is width delta x. The distance from this point to that point is delta x. And all of those delta x's are equal to 2 divided into n pieces. OK. Next, we're going to um, write down the coordinates of each of these little tick marks. In this first one, we want a distance of delta x, which is 2 over n. So that point right there is 2 over n on the x-axis. Now think about the next one. You have 2, 2 over n, so this should be 2 times 2 over n. So there we go. And then the one after that, you've gone a distance of 3 times delta x, which is 3 times 2 over n. So that's 3 times 2 over n, then 4 times 2 over n, and so on in that pattern. Um, if this is the kth tick mark, it's at x coordinate k times 2 over n. You've gone a dis if that's you've done k of these little subintervals, the total distance you've traveled is k times 2 over n. And you're going to continue that all the way up to Eventually, you're going to get to the last one, which is n times 2 over n. You've divided this into n pieces, after all, of length 2 over n. So you get to n times 2 over n, which is, if the n's canceled, that's a 2. So that brings you right there to 2. Now that we've recorded these x coordinates, we're going to start writing down our rectangles. 
Remember, we want to approximate this area A with rectangles. And what we're going to do is that for each one of these little equally spaced intervals, we're going to go over to the far right-hand corner of it and take F of that, and that's going to give us a height of a little, little skinny rectangle right there. We're going to call that rectangle number one. And then we're going to go to the next interval, and its endpoint is 2 times 2 over n. We're going to take f of that to get the height, and that's going to be rectangle number 2. And then we go to 3 times 2 over n. Right here, we're going to take f of that, and that's going to be the height of our third rectangle. And f of 4 times 2 over n would be the height of our fourth rectangle, and so on down the line. When we get to this sort of a generic point, k times 2 over n, think about, you know, k could be any number like 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. When you get to k times 2 over n, you go to that point, you take f of it, and that's your kth rectangle. I've made it shaded a little bit darker because that's, um, this is going to be our prototypical generic um, rectangle here. And just keep doing this process all the way up to n rectangles. Okay, so here we go. We want to approximate the area A under this curve as the sum of those n rectangles. Now things are specific enough here that we should be able to write down the area of any one of these rectangles. In fact, um, any one of these 10 rectangles that we have here in fact, think about the kth rectangle. Um, we could actually write down its area. The area of rectangle number k would be, well, the area of a rectangle is its height times its base. So here's the kth rectangle. Its base is delta x, and its height is f of k times 2 over n. So we should get for its area f of k times 2 over n times delta x. So there we go, f of k times 2 over n times delta x. But we can do better than that because we know what function f is, it's x squared. So it's f is just going to square this, and the delta x, we actually know what that is because delta x is 2 over n. So putting in that information, we get the area of rectangle number k is k times 2 over n squared times 2 over n, and multiplying all of that out, let's say we have a 2 squared times 2, that's an 8. Um, and this k is getting squared to so 8k squared. We've got an n squared on the bottom times an n here, and that's an n cubed. So the area of rectangle k is 8k squared over n cubed. So go back to this picture. Remember, in this picture, there are 10 rectangles, so n is equal to 10. And if you have 10 rectangles, the area of rectangle number k is 8k squared over n cubed. So for instance, the area of rectangle number 4 right there would be 8 4 squared over 10 cubed. The area of rectangle number 3 would be 8 3 squared divided by 10 cubed, and so on. This expression, 8k squared over n cubed, gives us the area of any one of these rectangles. You just have to plug in the k. And of course, you plug in the n equals 10. So we're getting someplace now. Remember that we said a, the area under the curve, was going to be approximated by the sum of the areas of n rectangles? And this is exactly where earlier we said, well, let's take this little detour and hold that thought. We'll do the sigma notation. This is exactly what sigma notation is designed to handle, the sum of areas of n rectangles. We've got this area of any one rectangle right here. And so if we take the sum of n rectangles, that's the sum from of rectangle 1 plus rectangle 2 plus rectangle 3. That's the sum from k equals 1 to n of the area of the kth rectangle, which is this function right here. So a is approximately equal to the sum of the areas of these rectangles, which is the sum from k equals 1 to n of 8k squared over n cubed.
That's just adding up the areas of these rectangles. Well, let's see. Here, n is fixed, which is the number of rectangles. Um, and although you might want to try more rectangles, right now it's fixed at n equals 10. So n cubed is a constant. That 8 is a constant. So you have an 8 over n cubed is a constant that could factor out of the sigma using one of our rules. So let's factor out the 8 over n cubed. And we get that times the sum from k equals 1 to n of k squared. Now look at the sum from k equals 1 to n of k squared. That's, um, we have a formula for that. In fact, that's the one I said, jot it down a few slides ago. Um, and it was this. So the 8n cubed is put right there. And then we use the formula for the sum from k equals 1 to n of k squared for right there. So right now we have a is approximately equal to this value the number of square units of area under this curve between 0 and 2 is approximately equal to this. So notice you just plug in what n is. Like if you plugged in n equals 10 here, you'd get some value. And that would be a number that's pretty close to a. Sure, it would probably be a little bit bigger than a because these rectangles overshoot that region. Um, but it'd be pretty close. So it would be pretty close, but of course it's not exact. Um, and what we want to do here is to be exact. Okay, so if you plug in n equals 10, you get a value that's maybe a little bigger than a. What are you going to do to make that more precise? Well, increase the number of rectangles. Instead of n equals 10, maybe n equals 20. And here it is, rectangle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, all the way up to 20 rectangles. And notice your delta x, it's still 2 over n, but n increased. Now n is 20, so it's skinnier. The, the width of all these rectangles is skinnier. Um, but nonetheless, if you took the sum from k equals 1 to 20 of 8k squared over um, 20 cubed, you would get a value here that's the sum of the areas of those 20 rectangles. And that would be pretty close to the area A. And sure, it'd be a little bit bigger than the area A because the stair step type thing overshoots the region a little bit. Okay, 20 rectangles is a better approximation, but it's not really that great. Um, let's do n equals 40. And you can see with 40 rectangles, they're you know, delta x equals 2 over n, where n is now 40, got even skinnier. You're cramming in more rectangles, and that, they really start to, to, to more closely fit the contour of this curve. So if you plug in n equals 40, the sum of the areas of those 40 rectangles is this expression right there. Just plug in 40 for n. You get some number. Um, and that's a pretty good approximation to a, better than the ones we had before. How do you get it better? Well, instead of n equals 40 rectangles, try n equals 80. Okay, here it is. Now you could, you'd almost have to have a magnifying glass to see the difference between the region formed by these rectangles and the actual curved region A. So if you plug in n equals 80 right here, that's going to give you the sum of the areas of those 80 rectangles. That's a really good approximation to A. Okay, well, we don't want just a really good approximation. We want to get it exactly. The bigger and bigger you make n, the closer and closer the sum of the areas of these n rectangles are to the actual area A. So we do what we're used to doing in calculus. We say A is actually going to be the limit as the number n of rectangles approaches infinity of the sum of the areas of those n rectangles. It's what you saw happening up here. Just let n get bigger. Like, Instead of 80, 160, then 1,000, then 2,000, then a million. As n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the sum of the areas of those n rectangles gets closer and closer to a, and the limit is equal to a. But this is not just theoretical, because we're pretty good at working out limits at this point, even limits as n goes to infinity. 
Look at this limit. The limit is n goes to infinity of the sum of the areas of the n rectangles, and we actually worked out an exact value for the sum of the areas of the n rectangles up here, and it's this. So this limit is fleshed out as the limit as n goes to infinity of, bring all this down, 8 over n cubed times 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n over 6. Now, to make this limit look a little bit more familiar, I'm going to take, I'm sort of going to swap the position of the 6 and the n cubed, bring the n cubed inside there and the 6 out there under the 8. So we get 8 sixth 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n over n cubed. Um, and <laughs> look at this limit. And this is something that you've actually seen before. Way back in chapter 2, when you talked about limits as n goes to infinity of rational functions, which is what we have here, the only difference is way back in chapter 2, instead of calling it n, you call it x, right? x was going to infinity. Um, here it's just n going to infinity. It's really the same thing. It doesn't matter what you call that variable. And we know how to work out a limit like this. We did it back in chapter 2. And there's a shortcut. Um, you look for the highest power of the variable, in this case n, on top it's 2n cubed, and down here 1 times n3, and you take those coefficients 2 over 1, and the limit is going to be equal to that. So in this case it would be that 2 divided by 1 multiplied by the constant of 8 sixth. So we get 8 sixths times 2 over 1, and that's equal to 8 thirds square units. So that's it. We've answered our question. The area under the curve here, shown shaded, is exactly 8 thirds square units. And that solves this problem. And it, out, it um, illustrates the basic approach that we're going to be taking, at least for the next two sections. And I think this is pretty impressive because this shape A, it was not a familiar shape from geometry. It's not a circle. It's not a part of a circle, it's not a triangle, it's not a um, rhombus, it's, it's, a, it's a parabola. Uh, there are no formulas from geometry that tell you what the area under a parabola is, but here we got it, 8 thirds square units of area. All right, um, this is... Um, the kind of problem that we're going to be working with in the next two sections, though interestingly, although it's, I would recommend maybe doing one or two of these in the um, odd-numbered problems just to get used to the terminology, these are the kinds of problems that you're not actually going to find yourself doing a lot of because very quickly in section 5.3, we're going to find a technique that bypasses and greatly simplifies all of the stuff that went on here. However, the stuff that went on here illustrates some really basic constructions that we're going to use that are very important and very important for applications. And if you continue with calculus and the study of mathematics and science, the kind of thinking that you do in problems like this is going to be very important to you. So, it really pays, I think, to read this section carefully and work a few of the problems. I want to summarize what we have done so far. In the previous slide, we had a specific function f of x and a specific value for a and b, it was 0 and 2. Um, and I want to talk about how you would set these up in general. In general, you'll have a function y equals f of x, and some x value a and some x value b. I'll leave them unspecified. And you'll want the area under the curve between a and b, the shaded area shown here. I'm going to walk you through how to set this up. And the real important thing here is it's going to illustrate a kind of sum that's called a Riemann sum. Riemann was a mathematician who lived back in the 1850s, and he, he did a lot of work with calculus. These things are named after him, and, and um, 
they're, they're in your future because we're going to do a lot of Riemann sums for the rest of the class. But here's the basic setup, and I'll put the definition of a Riemann sum down here. It's going to fall out of the setup. Imagine that you wanted to take the approach we did in the previous slide to find the area under this, shaded, uh, under this curve, the shaded area. The first thing you would do is, echoing what we did before, you divide the interval from A to B up into n pieces, where n is the number of rectangles that you want to put in there. So think about the width of each one of these rectangles. You're going to make it equally spaced. The, the text calls this like an equally spaced partition of the interval from A to B. Every one of these tick marks has the exact same distance between them. And what is that distance? How far apart are the tick marks? Well, you're taking the distance from A to B, which is a distance of B minus A, and you're dividing it into n pieces. So that width, which we'll call delta x again, equals b minus a divided by n. On the previous slide, it was, what, 2 minus 0 divided by n. So it was um, uh, 2 over n. But now, in general, b minus a over n. And then you want to establish some rectangles. So we're going to label our tick marks in sequence. A is going to be x0, then the next one is going to be x2, one, x1, and the next two, and the next three, and x4, and so on. The kth one, you'll call that x sub k, and you just keep going all the way up to the nth one, x sub n, which is going to be b. And those are the right-hand endpoints of all of your n little intervals. Now, the text calls these grid points, and we actually have a formula for them. Um, if you look at xk, how would you get it? Well, from a, you'd go a distance of k times delta x. So x of k, for any k, is a plus k times delta x. So, for example, x of 2 would be a plus 2 times delta x, and, and indeed it is. Okay, and now you're going to start thinking about your rectangles. But the general picture that we're going to have here that's a little more versatile than what we did before is going to involve the height of a rectangle, which is not necessarily got from f of a uh, endpoint, a right-hand endpoint. What we're going to do is we're going to pick what's called a sample point in each interval. So in this first interval, the so-called sample point it's going to be x sub 1 star, and that could just be any point whatsoever in this interval. You're free to choose it. You could take it to be all the way over here on the right, as we did last time, or right down in the middle, as I've indicated here, or maybe even put it over here in the left-hand side of that little sub-interval. Um, but it's got to be in that first little sub-interval. And the next one is x sub 2 star. That's the sample point in the second interval. And it could be anywhere in there. I'm putting it right in the middle just to make it fit. And then the next sample point in the next interval is x sub 3 star, then x sub 4 star, etc. Now, x sub k star would be a sample point in this kth interval. There it is, x sub k star. And all the way up to, let's see, the nth interval right here. The nth subinterval is going to have an x sub n star as a sample point somewhere in there. So again, these are called sample points. x sub k star is in the interval from x sub k minus 1 to x sub k, somewhere between here and here in general. OK, now what we're going to do is we're just now to start, start to make our rectangles. And for their heights, we're going to take f of the sample point. So for the first rectangle, we take f of x sub 1 star, and we get the height of that rectangle. For the second rectangle, we're going to take f of x sub 2 star, and then f of x sub 3 star for the third rectangle. And the height of the fourth rectangle is going to be f of x sub 4 star, and so on. We just keep going through that pattern. Here's rectangle number k here. Its height is f of x sub k star f of the sample point, 
and its thickness is delta x, which is b minus a over n. And we keep going with our rectangles all the way over to the nth rectangle. So as before, we have an, a formula for the area of rectangle number k. The kth rectangle, I've shown it gray, darker gray here. And mind you, this k, it could be any one of these rectangles. You could have k equals 4 or k equals 3, in which case those would be darkened. But this is just some number k, some subscript k, x sub k. This is the kth rectangle. And its area is going to be its height times its base. And its height is f of x sub k star. And its base is delta x, which of course equals this. So if we were going to add up the areas of all of those rectangles, you'd be adding up a bunch of terms that look like f of x sub k star times delta x, for k equals 1 all the way up to n. It would look like this. The sum from k equals 1 to n of f of x sub k star times delta x. You might think about that as the sum of the areas of those n rectangles. Now class, when you have a sum that's set up this way using this function f of x, uh, or any function f of x, and picking sample points like this, there's a special name for it. It's called a Riemann sum. That's what a Riemann sum is. Just an expression that looks like this, where you might think about it as adding up areas of rectangles. And if you were interested in the exact area under this curve, hmm, these rectangles adding up their areas would be pretty close because it looks like for every undershoot you have an overshoot. So it's going to pretty much balance out. It, you wouldn't expect it to be exact. But the sums of the areas of these rectangles, these n rectangles, would be pretty close to the actual shaded region under that curve, but not close, not exactly. So how do you get it exact? Huh, just like what we did before, you take the limit as n goes infinite, to infinity of this Riemann sum. So in a very real sense, the area under that curve between a and b is the limit as n goes to infinity of a Riemann sum. Now, maybe these limits are starting to look a little bit involved um, but I hope you see that it's, the basic idea is pretty simple here. Um, and as complicated as some of the expressions will get, I want you to think about pictures like this and um, the, the basic ideas that we're talking about are really kind of hands-on and easily understood. So in this lecture, we've um, We've really done, uh, the, the central thing we've done is we've, we've talked about the problem of finding areas under a curve, and that led into a discussion of sigma notation and some of its ramifications, and it's culminated with this idea of a Riemann sum. And looking ahead, Riemann sums will play a very significant role in this course. To recap what we've done today, We've seen that area is a limit of Riemann sums as the number of rectangles approaches infinity. The area under the curve, y equals f of x, as illustrated here, is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from k equals 1 to n of f of x sub k star times delta x. Coming up, we are going to take this limit and distill it into one of the most important definitions of the course. In Lecture 42, we'll talk about what's called the definite integral. We've seen indefinite integrals, but we'll have a new topic called the definite integral. And it is as important in this course as the idea of a derivative. And like the idea of a derivative, it's going to be defined as a limit. In fact, this limit. 
And also, like the derivative, that limit definition will give it meaning, but will come up with simple rules that allow us to evaluate the indefinite integral without actually working out this limit. And that comes in lecture 43 on the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is a culmination of everything we've done in this course. We will see that this complicated limit of Riemann sums actually equals something very simple involving antiderivatives, involving indefinite integrals. So that's where we're going. So read up on the definite integral, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.